much for being here tonight. I know it's um, not the easiest task to get here at 5.30 on a Tuesday and now August, but still in the middle of the summer. Uh, but I hope that you find it valuable to have taken this time away to invest in yourself and to revisit this area of your life. Um, and certainly uh, to get back on track or even just to reignite your motivation, your excitement. Uh, so I, I'm always excited to come to support groups because I'll tell you more about what I'm up to later, but I spend a lot of time on the computer. So I love getting to be back in um, the swing of things with patients. So I've worked in bariatric surgery like Chris had for eight years, um, and I love it. I've had, I drank the sugar-free Kool-Aid, I guess. Um, so, but we're going to get right into the topic. Uh, the slides are really simple. So I can do it by memory, and you're going to laugh when you see how simple they are. Like, well, they went through a lot of work to put up one bullet. <laughs> uh, but really, I want to focus on what I call kind of the, the five key areas to getting back on track, as if it was that simple, right? Like, these five steps, and that's all you have to do. So we know it's more complicated than that, but I do want to send you away with just these five areas of life, so if you need to refocus and revisit any of them, um, that you would feel motivated to do so. But I always like to start with this story because I like stories and they're funny and hopefully I'll make this one connect. Uh, you might wonder if I can, but I, I think I can. Uh, I've been married for uh, four and a half years and when I was engaged and we were going through the gift registries, my husband heard that you could register at Home Depot. Did you know this? Yeah. Yeah. So we had to, so we went to Home Depot and you know at this point we'd been to Crate and Barrel and we've been to Kohl's and they give you the gun and you go around you scan your UPC codes and you know what you're gonna get. Well you go to Home Depot and they hand you a clipboard with a piece of paper and a pencil. And you write down what you might want. So he went around, oh my gosh, like a kid in a candy store writing down what he wanted to register at Home Depot. And he did get a couple of the things, but for the most part he got a stack of gift cards. And that was really exciting because then he got to add up his gift cards and figure out which tools he wanted to get. Uh, and he has kind of a background in, in construction, so this was exciting. And we go to Home Depot on that day and you know he's all excited. And the moment the clerk had to pull out a ladder and get something on the top shelf, I mean, he was just beaming. Apparently that's like a status symbol. If the clerk <laughs> needs to pull out the ladder to get your tool at the top. Most of those tools he has put to use. I, I can give him credit to that. Most of those tools he's used. But one tool in particular, which it, for those of you that know what it is, in my horrible explanation of it, you'll laugh at me, uh, but he has yet to use his pin nailer. Does anyone have a pin nailer? Yeah, maybe you could explain it better than I could, but he has this ambition of being this great carpenter. And the pin nailer is more for like the trim of a window. It's more like, you know, fine uh, nails. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Are those what they're called? <laughs> uh, so he's yet to have a reason to use his pen nailer. He hasn't had a project. He hasn't had a reason. I'm not totally sure why that was on his list of things he yeah, had yeah, to yeah. have. But he, got, good. he it sounded good. It looked good. It needed the ladder. So he got it. Uh, but you might say that he's never been motivated to ever use the pen nailer. He's never been motivated to read the instructions, right? And then meanwhile, I haven't had any projects that required a pen nailer. And it turns out that I'm a very good accountability partner when it comes to what projects he's going to get done, right? That's honey-do list. So I haven't had any reason to hold him accountable to use the pin nailer, and he hasn't <laughs> been motivated to use the pin nailer. So it's a great tool that sits in the garage. And that's how I'm going to tie it back around, that when we talk about meal planning, when we talk about grocery shopping, we talk about you know, getting back on track, to me, the two most important things to start with are how are you going to get motivated and who is going to keep you accountable. Without those things, it starts getting pretty mundane really fast. Like, what's going to get you in the kitchen to cook dinner if it's been a long day? You need some something, some sort of carrot, some sort of a motivator that says, this is why I do this. And what I've found is that when it comes to motivation, what might have motivated you a year ago may not be cutting it today. Seasons change, things change. Maybe what first motivated you was having surgery in the first place. That was very exciting. You were reading your pamphlets, you were coming to meetings, and it was a motivating, you know, naturally very motivating. But then you have the surgery and things kind of, you know, life kind of gets back into rhythm, and that is no longer the motivator. Or maybe, it, you know, what motivated you was a trip or an event or something that was a date that has come and gone. 
Uh, and so those motivations can really change and we have to evolve with them and figure out well, what's going to keep me going today. What I've also decided about motivation, this is not any studies, this is just what I've decided, that I categorize motivation into two categories. Internal motivation and external motivation. And you being here tonight and me speaking with you tonight would be an external motivator, right? It's around you. Hopefully I say something that kind of helps you out. Uh, you, you meet friends or recon, you know, reconnect with people and those are external motivators. But the most powerful form of motivation is what? The internal motivation, that fire that is ignited inside of you. And that's when you're like pumped up, you're excited to make a meal plan, you're ready to try a new recipe, you've got your blinders on, and that's because you've got that true personal motivation. That's also the hardest kind to find, you know, when you've lost it, trying to recapture it. In my opinion, the more we surround ourselves in external motivators, the more likely we are to get that internal motivation going again. So coming to support group, you get to check that off your list. You made that one. Uh, but sometimes it's looking at photos of when you're at your highest weight or before surgery, just to remember how far you've come. Uh, if you happen to keep a journal before surgery or you even Facebook posts from before surgery, just to kind of remind you where you've been and, and what you've been, you know, how far you've come. Uh, sometimes new tennis shoes or a new water bottle or a new recipe. You get the idea. Those are all external motivators, but added together with a friend and with conversation can start to ignite that internal motivation again. But to me, that you have to start there. If you're going to get back on track, we've got to find out well, what's going to be your carrot that will dangle in front of you that will keep you going. And then the, the other thing I mentioned was accountability. When I mentioned the pin nailer, I haven't been holding him accountable to it because I haven't had need for a trimmed window. Accountability, I think a lot of us can agree, is really, really helpful. You know, I've had many patients say, if I could just come to you once a week, I would do really well. Not necessarily because they needed to talk to me, but just if I have to see you, that will keep me <laughs> accountable, right? Neither of us really have time for a weekly visit. Uh, but I found that you can still tap into accountability um, in, in different ways. Although I've found that sometimes the best accountability partner, if you partner with someone, is not necessarily a relative and not necessarily a best friend. You want those people to support you. So building up your support system and getting everybody on board and educating everyone on what you, know, what you need to be eating or what you need to be doing, you can't have too much support. What I mean with accountability is one person in particular that will check on you to say, did you achieve what you set out to do? You know, if your goal was to limit eating out to only three times this week, is there going to be someone to check in on you at the end of the week to see if you did it? I have an accountability partner in my business, uh, and we met on an online group. So we have no personal connection except for business. And we have a Google Calendar invitation every week, every Wednesday, and we send each other the three things we're going to do that week, and then we follow, when that invitation comes up, we have to follow up and say, okay, did you do your three things? Why or why not? What are you going to change? Uh, but I always know that that time is coming. I had to check in with her tomorrow because Wednesday's coming. And I like that she's not necessarily in my personal circle. It's kind of nice to have someone that, you know, if your accountability partner is also the person that you go to bed with at the end of the day it may not be the best fit because I don't really want you staring at me if I give in to the ice cream, right? <laughs> so there's, there's like a healthy balance there. Um, but when it comes to accountability partner, I feel like what's very important is that you have a good blend of honesty, that they're honest with you, like, you know, I want more for you. I think you can be doing better. I'm, I can be honest about that out of kindness and grace. But then there is the grace component that says, it is okay. You know, my business my business partner had a really bad reaction to uh, sumac. Is anyone familiar? It's like yeah. poison yeah. ivy. Yeah. To I me, mean, she yeah. Unfortunately, like there's heads nodding. Like yes. So did I hold her accountable to the three things that she had to get done when she had this horrible sumac out? No, of course I did. I gave her grace and told her to go rest and take it easy for the week. So there is a balance between grace and some honesty. But one reason why my husband is not a good accountability fit is because he gives me way too much grace. You don't feel like cooking? That's fine. I'll go pick it up. Like, I need a little bit of help here. So. 
So, so I really wanted to start with those two parts. So if you start with what's going to motivate you, who can hold you to these things, then we can talk about what you're going to do. But to me, it's like before you kind of pull out, okay, these are all these are the five things you need to do to get back on track. Don't miss the importance of the mental side of it, of being motivated and excited to do it, rather than being told to do it. Uh, and then someone that will encourage you and hold you to it. So then the third one, so that was number one and two. And the number third, uh, the number three key to get back on track is to really focus on the four, what I would call, pillars to physical health. And I'll talk about a more specific plan, but I'm just talking about the four kind of basic biological needs that our body has. I don't think I'll surprise you with any of them, uh, but the first one is water. So at the most fundamental basic level, we all need water. Every cell in your body needs water. And I know that's hard for some of you, and for some of you it may be easier. But when you're even mildly dehydrated, your energy is lower, so then your activity is not as high. Oftentimes we confuse hunger and thirst, so you may be thirsty, but you're snacking because you think you're hungry. Um, and your fat metabolizes better if you're well hydrated, so you may just not have as efficient of a fat burning if you're low on water. Because that's one of the four kind of fundamental basic needs that your body has. So water is a big one. If that's an area of struggle for you, you might find an accountability partner <laughs> and work towards that goal. Uh, and then the second one is consistent meal times. If you've gotten off track with having kind of consistency in your meals and you're kind of flying by the seat of your pants or picking a little here and a little there, we've all done it. Like, oh, what do you need? It's lunchtime. It's 3.30, you know, those kind of loosey-goosey meal times. But fundamentally, our body craves that consistency and those, those protein meals at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, having a routine, and the more routine you give your body, uh, the more it will fall into these other things of you know, handling your hunger, keeping your metabolism up, keeping your energy up. Uh, and then the four of these four pillars, so we have water, consistent meal times. Oh, I didn't do the third one. The third one is quality food. So the, the fuel that you put in your body, lean proteins and vegetables, We'll get into a more specific plan, but when we talk about the four pillars, um, quality foods, consistent meals, water, and exercise. So those are, once you're motivated, once you're ready to be held accountable, just review those four areas. Like, am I meeting the most basic needs of my body? If I'm missing one of those, I need to focus on that before I get onto a really rigid plan. Let's make sure we're meeting the basics. Any questions so far? I'm a talker, I'm supposed to stay in one place, I use my hands a lot. Um, and also, I'm giving you an abridged version of a video series that I have on my website called a Back on Track series. So hopefully to you I'm not going too fast, but to me it feels fast because I have, you know, I'm getting through in my mind a lot in a smaller amount of time. Uh, okay, so number one, motivation. Number two, accountability. Number three is revisiting those four basic needs of your body. That was three. three. And then um, number four would be then to set a realistic plan. So that's when you're like, okay, but what, what do I do? What do I actually do? And setting a realistic plan would be now you're setting a date. Okay, when am I starting this? Now you're making a meal plan. Okay, what am I doing? You're making a grocery list. You're getting the grocery before that date starts, and now you're kind of putting feet to the pavement, right? There are a couple different approaches to this. Who's heard of the pouch reset, the pouch test, reboot this? Yeah, you've heard of all these different things. Um, and there's some of them can work, some of them, someone's probably trying to make money off of it, so we have to kind of find what's a good fit for you. And, um, and I'll give you kind of my feelings on the styles, because I feel we're all different, so we all like different styles, right? As long as they meet those basic needs, it's okay to use a different style. So one thing I would say about the pouch test is that I just, I don't love the name of it, because unless your doctor said otherwise, your anatomy doesn't necessarily need to be tested. You know, your stomach is a resilient organ. It's three layers of muscle, 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 muscle. So if you, have ever entertained the thought like, oh, I think I've stretched my stomach. 
and I think there's something wrong with my surgery. I just want to encourage you that aside from a doctor's visit where you truly think something has, has changed, it's highly likely that your anatomy is as it should, but what may have been happening is that when you eat high carbohydrate foods, sugary foods, starchy foods, breads, pasta, rice, those foods leave your stomach quickly, right? We call them slider foods, they leave quickly. So it can look like your portions are getting bigger because you can fit more in, right? You can kind of keep going on crackers or popcorn, things that slide through more easily. Carbohydrates also highly increase your hunger. So if you've been eating more of those carbohydrate foods and you think, well, I'm eating much bigger portions and I'm hungry all the time, it's very natural to think what? I stretched out my stomach. Likely what's happening is it's just those food choices getting kilter kilter. But if you get back to your basics and you don't drink with your meals and you focus on a more lean, solid, textured protein, you're not drinking with it, then you feel that restriction coming right back. Uh, the process, if you know, if you've gotten off track with carbohydrates and snacks, I won't make you raise hands, right? Uh, but I could raise my hand. Everyone's done it. That process of getting carbohydrates back out of your system, it takes about four to five days. So when they say, oh, we're gonna do this pouch reset diet for five days, really the idea behind it is they're trying to just clean up your eating choices. So that by day five, the carbohydrates in your system have really calmed down, your appetite's calmed down, your hunger is more controlled. Uh, but the style of diet, with, if, you, if you aren't familiar with it, is that they do kind of a an abridged version of your diet progression right after surgery. So instead of doing two weeks of shakes, maybe you do a day or two of shakes, and then your soft proteins, and then back to solid proteins. So that's kind of the style of it, but really to me the idea behind it is just to get the carbs out of your system. So it's nothing magical about the plan. It's more about the purpose behind it. Um, what I would recommend, if you, if you feel like that style of a diet would help for you, my recommendation is to not weigh during that week. It's very tempting to do something like that and then weigh yourself and you're looking to the scale for the results. But what I would do is treat it as more of a mental reset than about the number on the scale. Because the idea behind it would be to get the carbohydrates out of your system and then ease you back into a good eating plan, a good lifestyle, and that's when the results are gonna come, is when you're, it's the longevity and the consistency, right, rather than what you lost in that first week. So that would be my recommendation, because it's, it gets really tempting, I know, to be like, well, surely I've lost something if I've done two days of shakes. And you probably have, but it's more about our mental reset. Like, okay, I'm doing this to kind of clean my mind, clean my kitchen, clean the slate, and get back onto a good eating plan. And I'll check in on the scale down the road. So that would be my recommendation there. If you think that reliving your post-op diet sounds awful and you don't want to go back to shakes and liquid proteins and do that all over again, that is not the be-all end-all of a you know getting back on track diet. The whole idea is to get the carbohydrates out. So as long as you plan your meals, you're focusing on proteins, vegetables, getting creative but making uh, your post-op diet your routine again. It'll still take that four to five days where you'll, you'll feel kind of shaky, hungry, uncomfortable because those carbohydrates are I mean, truly having some withdrawal type of symptoms. But it doesn't have to be like a shake kind of style. It can be just getting back on track, telling your accountability partner, the first five days are gonna be tough, I need help, <laughs> those sorts of things. But that, does that make sense? There's, there's different approaches, but at the, end of the, at the end of the day, it's really just about getting back to those four pillars of water, consistent meals, quality food of lean proteins, vegetables, uh, and, and getting in some exercise. If you are interested in more of a specific plan, I didn't bring handouts with me today, uh, but I have PDF files of a back on track grocery list and um, some eating plans with both styles. Uh, and if you'd like those, if you opt into my email list, I'd be happy to email out the PDFs. Uh, so that there's a list over there, that's why I pointed to the table, because if you leave that email address, I'll be sure and give you those PDF files. Okay, so that was number four. The fifth one is what I call trashing the triggers. And this is really sticky. This, this could be a whole topic in itself. It's kind of the dynamics of food culture around us. 
Where do we spend the most of our time? Did you say vacation? <laughs> oh, I was like, I want to be what, what's Lauren doing? Yeah, yeah. Yes, in the kitchen. Yeah, at home. Exactly. Yeah. So that sh yeah, segue nicely. So at home, you spend the most of your time at home or if you're working at work. And those are the two, can be the two hardest places when it comes to what's around you and your food. Unless you're not working and you live alone or you have a different scenario. But the majority of us have to figure out how to set our, ourselves up for success in our environment when you can't control all of it. And it's a sticky conversation. So like I said, we could go into this for a lot longer. Uh, Real quick, touching on your work environment, and I know that that's such an individual thing, but if you do have a work culture that has a lot of food around, I mean, I know a lot of businesses that have like food day every month, like just a day to celebrate food every month. Does anyone have food day? We yeah, have see, there's more than one. We have the different departments, and by every department, we're all on the same floor. Yeah. There's really no reason that. We probably have three a week. Three a week. Wow. Three a week, and they have like food My department knows what I eat. I love that. They have bagels. They have fruit. They usually bring me hummus. I love that. So that's a great, that's, she's making my point for me. That as long as you let everyone know how they can support you, what, what can you have, what can you not have. Uh, some people are going to be on board. Some people aren't. Sometimes you can just avoid the break room. Sometimes it filters into everywhere you go. Uh, you know, certainly having your own drawer of things you can have. It, but absolutely, it, it is worth it to figure out, even talk to your accountability partner about, you know, sometimes someone else can just help brainstorm with you. What could you do to set yourself up for a better experience when you're surrounded by food? Because you can only control so much, but you can control some. So what can I control inside of what I can't? Uh, food, three times a week. That is crazy to me. How much are you guys working? <laughs> <laughs> Enough that they just make you eat while you work. Well, yeah. no, we have Bluetooth. I work for a billing firm, so a medical billing firm, so we have Bluetooth, so we can walk around the entire building and do talk to patients, talk to doctors, do whatever, and head back to our desk. Yep. So that makes sense. So you can talk talk with your taco. I mean, <laughs> uh, so so we have the work culture, and then we have home. And what's tricky about home and family is that. When you combine food and family, it can get sticky so fast. Food is personal, so don't take that away from me. Don't tell me what I need to do. Uh, but you also are living under one roof, right? So there is that balance of well, what, what can I tell you to do if I need to be supported versus do I just have to deal with this? And I think that just is something you have to communicate. In my family, I'm very lucky that my husband is not picky, so that's what we got going for us. Anything I put in front of him, if it's hot, it's fine. Um, and which is, this is on a side, but I actually made chicken chili tonight, which if you're thinking it's August 1st, why would you make chicken chili? <laughs> the things you do when you have to create recipes for projects, right? So, so I did put a hot meal in front of him tonight, it was chicken chili. Um, so he'll eat anything, but his, his fault is snacking, grazing. I feel like I'm always picking up crumbs in front of the pantry. Like, <laughs> seriously, I'm like, between you and a toddler, I'm just always sweeping this area up. So what we've found that works is that he has his own shelf, the toddler has her own shelf, and I have my own shelf. And I do the shopping, so I replenish things on the shelf. But it has helped me to get into a habit of just, my eyes just go to the, the shelf in front of me. Uh, many patients of mine will just do a separate cabinet all together, a separate drawer all together, just to keep themselves out. Uh, same thing in the fridge, your own shelf, your own uh, drawer, something like that. But then beyond that, we also have what we call the contraband list. And those are the things that just are not allowed in the Wagner household. And we both get to add things to the list. And the list does grow. <laughs> we find out, oh, that needs to be added. Now that I know that I need the whole thing. but. Uh, graham, graham crackers cannot come into our house. I can go through a sleeve of graham crackers in record time, so do not bring them into my house. Uh, but I had, I had him add what he would want, and he said, don't put Oreos on there. I'll, I'll just make myself sick by eating so much of them. So we have just, I mean, we have it in writing, like a written family contraband list. So uh, if that's helpful for you, then, and 
invite everybody to add to it. You know, make it, this isn't just about you making your list and what they can't have in your house. It's more just like, hey, what foods would you add if you could? And kind of making it um, a collective thing. But one final note on that, because I always have to say it, in case it pertains to anyone, and it may not, but soda is a whole different thing. I had well, at least one head nod. So if soda is your trigger, because we're talking about trashing the triggers, if soda is your trigger, but you're sharing a household with people that are not going to give up soda, it is a really hard combination. Because if you have to open the refrigerator and that icy cold Dr. Pepper is staring back at you, I mean, many a person is going to fall weak on their knees to that. So what I found has worked for most everyone, not everyone, is, um, is buying a mini fridge and putting it in the garage or the back corner of the basement and asking your family members to stock it themselves and just to help you stay out of it. You know, you, we all have to live under this roof. I really need to stay out of it. And it's so addictive. It's so difficult for me. I'm not saying you need to stop it, but, but if you continue drinking, will you just put it, I'll get you the fridge. Will you fill up the fridge and, and you can keep it over here. So for some people that works, some do, it doesn't. But my encouragement there is just to revisit how you can set your environment up for your best success. All right, so those are the, the five keys. Motivation, accountability, those four kind of main pillars of water, consistent meals, quality food and exercise. And then setting a realistic plan. Okay, well, what's my what's my real plan here? Meal planning. Flying by the seat of our pants is, never gets us anywhere. Uh, and then that fifth one is to trash the triggers. Um, a little bit more about, we don't have it tied up here, so I won't be able to show you my website. But uh, so I have been, I've worked in three bariatric clinics in eight years, and I love it. Uh, but I've had the opportunity to transition online. So now everything I do is on my bariatric nutrition website. Um, I have video courses, like I mentioned, the Back on Track video course, uh, meal plans, hundreds of recipes. I think I hit 500 a couple months ago. Um, so I have cookbooks here tonight. They're, the cookbook's available on Amazon. If you don't want to purchase tonight, it's $16.95 on Amazon. Uh, it's $15 tonight. If my card reader can work, if you have cash, I can do cash. If my card reader doesn't work, I'm going to have to send you to Amazon, so we'll find out. What's that? What's the name? Oh, that's a great idea. Thank you, Janice. The name of the cookbook is Best Fork Forward. Okay. And then the tagline is Everyday Dinners After Weight Loss Surgery. But if you're going to search it on Amazon, Best Fork Forward. Yeah. Do you, um, are your recipes mainly for like people that have big families? Like my kids are all in college, so I'm by myself. Yeah. So I usually just um, that's have a great small point. portions and like make my stuff for the entire week. A lot of times I end up having the same meal. All week long. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, my gosh, if I have to look at this one. Yeah. Um, I actually have a video course on cooking for one. Uh, there's a couple things you can do. So the majority of the recipes are serves for, just because it's easier to do it okay. that way. Uh, but there's also the feature that you can add, you know, how many servings if you want to uh, change the number up or down. There's also a meal planner on there. And that's, so the, my website is, there's free content and then there's a paid level. Thank you. Uh, so the paid level has a meal planner, and that's where you can drag and drop recipes into the calendar, and you can change if you're serving, uh, if you want to change the serving size, so then you can buy one pack of chicken and cook two different chicken meals or something like that. But um, I also do a lot of, I freeze a lot of individual sizes. Do you do the muffin pan? And then, I do. I yeah. do, like, when I make them, eight liters of spinach and yes. spinach and mushrooms. And make your little egg cups. I do that with chili. I'll make my chili and then scoop it in and freeze it. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I think you're doing great. Then, yeah, but I just, I, sometimes I get tired of having the same thing all the time. It's just me. So. Yeah. Yes. Well, there's, yeah, like 500 and some recipes just to get your wheels turning. You can play around. Oh. So if you're like, I can't remember that website later, you can take a card. But it's foodcoach.me. Um, and then under the recipes tab, when it has a pink box by it, that means it's for paying members. The first two weeks is free. And then the membership is $10 a month after the first two weeks. And then if it doesn't have a pink border, 
then it's free for anyone to see. So there's pureed and soft, and then there's, uh, I think this is, I think we're on the soft tab. So if you're beyond your liquids and sauce, <coughs> you, what you can also do is click on these, uh, those boxes on the side, and you can go into more specific meals, oven baked, slow cooker, chicken, beef, breakfast. <coughs> Uh, if I were logged in, I would show you the meal planner. I wonder if this won't take too long. I'll go for it. I want to make sure they have plenty of time for discussion. Okay. So I take you that. I'll do this again. How much is it to be a member? So the membership is $10 a month uh, after the first two weeks. So you don't pay for the first 14 weeks. Just go, if you go to the website at the top here, it'll say sign up. Oh, okay. So that husband of mine with the pen nailer is a web developer, so we get to do this together. Wow. So when he's not working on his uh, carpentry skills, which is not often. Oh. I'm not 
not sure. I haven't played around with Berry Tastic enough. I know that in my Fitness Pal, I can just add the rest. All I have to do is add my the link to my Fitness Pal, and we'll go right in. Um, I'd have to. Does any, is anyone familiar? Can you take an outside website and put the URL into Berry Tastic, and then we'll put the. Oh, I was just downloading the app here. Okay. Our code is seven six three one nine. Seven six three one nine is the code for the Berry Tastic. And in case you're 